Hello and welcome <laughs> to uh, this uh, session. I did say when Lisa booked it that this room was too big and I was right. But um, welcome uh, to this session with Joanna Lumley. We, uh, when Lisa Campbell and Phil Edgar Jones asked us to do this, it was because uh, Joanna with me are uh, doing a tour around Britain later in the autumn and I thought this will be great. It'll be the, like the final dress rehearsal for the tour. But uh, that's not quite the case. If we were comedians, which we're not, we, we're very much a work in progress uh, session. So it's, uh, it's going to be me interviewing Joanna primarily about her career in television and what we can learn from her um, having been, she's primarily been obviously uh, on the, in front of the camera, but she has also worked as a producer and a director. So we're going to try and glean from her what uh, we can learn uh, for, that might be useful for the Edinburgh TV Festival. Uh, I first started working with Joanna Almost 30 years ago, I was an AP with Ruby Wax, and uh, we did this uh, little sketch where the idea was that Ruby was trying to get ratings, so she was doing through the keyhole, but without permission. So uh, she smashed the window, she went in, and we dressed the house, and Joanna was so brilliant in it, and so funny, playing herself, that we had 300 letters of complaints that how dare we break into Joanna Lumley's house, which I, as the AP, had to reply to all of them. And, uh, and then, so, we carried on working together and we did other sketches with the Ruby Wax and obviously Joanna has had a phenomenal career. Uh, she's one of the few people who's been a kind of hit in drama, comedy and non-scripted. And uh, so there's lots of things to talk about. So I thought, well, what clip could I show to introduce her? So I chose one of mine, um, which was, uh, this is series three of the full wax. And over, the, over series one and two, uh, Joanna has been rehabilitated from having a complete nervous breakdown and Ruby's trying to relaunch her career. This is at the very early stages. Uh, Ab Fab had just started, uh, but uh, I thought we could show a little clip of Ruby trying to relaunch Joanna's career. So if you could play that, VT. Please welcome to the stage, Joanna Lumley. God, it's extraordinary seeing those again, you know. I only saw it sideways on from the back, but I can just remember that cringe-making feeling. I became hysterical when I had the purdy wig on and was having to do those things in the car park, rolling over the bonnets of cars and doing all the things that, in the Avengers, I used to be able to do. And, of course, now, after a major nervous breakdown and having to be rehabilitated, completely impossible. And Ruby and I were just crying with laughter. And whenever we two are together, sometimes with Clive, we look those things up and we put them on and we just sit there and we do nothing but laugh. It's pathetic, isn't it? Really? <laughs> this is what'll happen when you're old and you retire. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, so we'll, we we'll might talk about Ruby in a bit late, but we thought, I thought we'd start with drama because mm. that's loosely where you started uh, in terms of television, in terms of your career. Um, you'd been on, you'd had a few appearances on Steptoe & Son and Are You Being Served? And on the buses. On the buses, all the greats. And then you landed the role of Elaine Perkins in Coronation Street. Yeah. Now, Elaine, as many people here will know, was briefly Ken Barlow's girlfriend. So I did some research about Elaine Perkins, and this is what it comes up. Elaine Perkins, despite several proposals, she had remained unattached, considering herself not ready for marriage. When she met Ken, she was seeing a liberal politician and enjoyed the occasional jaunt overseas. Over the following weeks, Elaine and Ken went on several dates as friends. They found each other stimulating company. This is old days for Coronation Street. Debating such topics as censorship and snobbery in the art world, Ken began follow it, falling for Elaine and tried to interest her in going to the countryside with him. However, she had a prior engagement and turned him down. Ken grew jealous of other men in Elaine's life. Later, she revealed that she had arranged to go to Brussels with her friend Timothy. Ken asked her whether Timothy was a friend or a lover and confessed that he was in love with her himself. Elaine tried to reject Ken gently, but when he called her permissive with other men, she spurned him more firmly, labelling him a stiff provincial twit. And that was the end of your career in Coronation this Street. Is a, it's a complete mystery. That whole thing is a complete mystery because all I remember was that I said, can I go to the Rover's return? And they said, no, you're too posh. So I said, well, what do I do? And they said, you stay at home and you drink sherry because that's a posher drink. And when Ken comes around to show your brainy, you can be picking apart a transistor radio and putting it together again. 
And that's all I remember, except that I had to say when Ken said, will you marry me? And I said, no, because I don't want to stay in Coronation Street. And I said, please don't make me say that. Please, I want to do this job. I really want a long, long time part in this lovely show. And they said, no, you're just in for eight episodes. If you remember, Ken Bar Barlow's wife had just had a tragic end. She'd electrocuted herself on a hairdryer. Do you remember that? <laughs> and Ken was a bit in rags and he'd fallen for the headmaster's daughter, Elaine. Oh, it was great. Many years later, Clive, the clock whizzes forward, 35 years, I don't know. They said, will you come back into Coronation Street and break Ken's heart again? I went, you bet. And I couldn't because I was doing, I think, one of Clive's shows. And so I couldn't come back. And I think the part went to somebody like Rudolf Lenska. Stephanie Beecham. Stephanie Beecham. <laughs> what they used was, to be friends. What yeah. was... Um, what were soaps viewed like in 1973 as a, as a budding young actress? Were they something you aspired to? I mean, nowadays, ITV depend on Coronation Street. It's oh, and chic people. I mean, once Ian McKellen went into Coronation Street, there was no stopping everybody. Everybody then just tore off. It was as if they just sort of suddenly went, I am Batman. And they just went, I want to be on Coronation Street. I want to be in EastEnders. But Corrie was the one that caught them. But in the old days, all I wanted was a job that went on for more than one episode of On the Buses you know, which I was paid 60 quid for. And I thought if I could just get myself into something which had a kind of constant character, I could begin to be known and then people might want me there and I could stay there. But I was only in it for eight episodes. That was when there were two episodes a week. And coming up to Manchester and going to the green room of Coronation Street and being there when an Australian tour had come to the end of its huge journey around the world. They'd been to the pyramids, They'd been down the Rift Valley, they'd seen the Grand Canyon, they'd been up the Empire State Building. And the highlight of the tour was to come to Coronation Street. And many of them were crying, just crying to find themselves in that iconic place. And, you know, to see Ina Sharp with Vi Carson walking past, you'd go, hello, and they'd go, oh my God, as if they'd seen the Virgin Mary. It was pretty thrilling stuff. It was pretty thrilling, and it was a big bump when I came back from that. I did couldn't it, get arrested. Did, it pay, did it pay well in those days? No, nothing paid well for people like me in those days. I mean, 70, 80 quid a show was about what you got. Because you were a single mum in those days. You must have been desperate to stay. And didn't you try and bribe the producers, the writers? You, you do everything you can. But the truth is, if, you're, if your name isn't on the card, it isn't going to be there. You don't know how to get, you don't know how to get a job that lasts. I was um, Harry H. Corbett's girlfriend and Steptoe and Son. Um, on the buses, I can't remember what I did, but I was somebody's girlfriend. And in um, something else, up the workers, you tell me what it was. I was always somebody's girlfriend, sitting there dressed usually quite nicely, in your colour scheme, pale blue and a bit of beige, and looking quite nice, and speaking with this voice, always with this voice. And I'd say, I can do another voice. And they'd say, we don't want that silly voice. And I'd go, I can do it in French. And they'd say, we don't want that voice. We want, you've just got to speak in this ghastly voice which rather trims it down. So I sit there going, how lovely, how lovely. <laughs> and then a few, well, it was two or three years later, the new Avengers came about. And you must have, it must have, you must have known that it was on the card. How did the whole audition process Well, look, process everybody come? in the world, for a start, Britain didn't want to do the new Avengers again. They said, it finished. Not with Di Rigg, funnily enough, but who came after her was Linda Thorson, who was a lovely Canadian actress who was only 19 when she got the part. By this time, Patrick was maybe 45, coming up to 50. And it was an uneasy at gap. But Linda was very shapely. I'm sure many of you can remember her. Very shapely. And by shapely, I always mean bosomy. I always mean huge bosoms. Linda had bosoms. And so when Britain said, oh, we don't want to do the show again, Canal Plus in France said, but we will take this show up because we love the Pocratudinus of the girl, and they thought they were getting Linda. And they got me, with my cut hair, and then, in those days, rather a thin, flat chest, and they were really disappointed. But it was financed by the French, which was the reason why, because we, we had those embargoes against taking anything to South Africa at the time. France didn't. So we went down to South Africa on a trip, the three Avengers, Patrick, Gareth, and me, and the country closed down, we had motorbike outriders. We had whole floors of hotels and constant bodyguards. Parliament stopped sitting the night we were on. I mean, it was massive. And it was just the first breath of what stardom could be. The first and only breath. <laughs> I just thought I'd slip that in. It never happened again. Were you conscious that it was, because it was 
Canadian money and French money and, and a little bit of British money. And did that, does that affect the actors and actresses, or do you not care? You just the money comes and uh, the money. Well, the I money. Mean, the money for the, for the, the money for the show. It sort of comes. I seem to remember. I might be. This might be something you don't say at a television festival, and it shouldn't really be broadcast. But I think we ran out of money owing Pinewood plenty. So then we were sold to the French. And then the French ran out of money and sold us to the Canadians. By the time we got to Canada, only three of the Avengers went, Gareth, Patrick and me, nobody else. And the Canadians had a completely different view of it. They liked killing with real knives and punching people to pulp and kicking their faces. And we said, oh, in the Avengers, we don't do that. And they said, well, we do it over here in Canada like that, bam. And so we were in a slightly different show. And when Gareth and I discovered we were being paid less than the assistant wardrobe master, we were a bit cheesed off. And were you, was it equal pay? Uh, did you, uh, were you and Gareth and... and <coughs> no, Patrick, and Patrick, quite Patrick rightly. Patrick was a bit grander, but obviously. Well, Patrick was the Avengers. You couldn't do the Avengers without Patrick McNee. And the funny thing was, he thought he acted Steed. Those of us who knew him knew that he actually was Steed. He could ride, he was courteous, he refused to use, like Steed, he refused to use a gun because having been in the war, he couldn't bear anything like that. He was immensely amusing. His nickname was Bits because he was always cutting bits out of newspapers and pushing them under the dressing room. Darling, I thought you'd be interested in this. Little notes coming out of the doors, about anything under the sun. He was, of course, paid more than we were. And I think he was rolled into the part of the action. But Gareth and I were on a buyout fee. It's all changed now, sweet young children, as I look out at you. But when, at my age, we were back in those days, whatever you did seemed to be a buyout fee for Jolly Little. So for um, 600, I think it was 6,000 pounds for 13 whole episodes in the first year, worldwide buyout for all time. Not a lot of money, no repeats. And the next year it shot upwards to 8,000 pounds for the whole year. So 14,000 pounds got you 26 episodes, hour long. And how long would it take to film yeah. those 26 episodes? It always took, we were, well, we started a new episode every two weeks. They said, we can accomplish these in two weeks. Not one episode ended in under three weeks. So we'd start another one, but we'd have the tail end of the one before. And on one call sheet day, it looked down, and I had Purdy in five different episodes, the scenes I was doing that day, five different episodes. So I had, cleverly, thought up this hairstyle, which never changed, and just two gold stud earrings. So no matter, rather like one of those dolls you dress up with tabs on its shoulders, stick stuff on me and I'm still the same, still roughly the same, doing stuff, not doing stuff, reacting to stuff, get out of the car, run, just run. You go, where, what am I running for? Just run. <laughs> I did love that show, I loved it. I was on first call every morning for two years. I did, I did, all my own stunts. Well, I couldn't ride a motorbike. And they said, we can teach you in a lunch hour. What's the problem? A big motorbike. Ride it round the yard. The yard was as big as this square here. Ride round and then, then you can do motorbike stunts. So I was a bit of a chicken. And I got um, a man called Colin, who was a stunt man, quite slight. He had to wear a wig and show his hairy legs. <laughs> and he was purdy on the motorbike. We've, um, we've got, I've chosen a little clip from an episode called Sleeper. Do you remember that one? I do. Can you set the scene for us? I can, because in the Avengers, nothing was done by halves. So we would have these huge, almost Bond-like themes, which the very clever writer Brian Clemens, who's, who's died now, um, used to pick up, I think, stealing some from everywhere. Anyway, in this one, there was some enormous sort of sleeping draft which would go into the water and put London to sleep so nefarious villains could wreak havoc on the great city. The Avengers were inoculated bravely inoculated against it. And then we remained awake. And so while people, you saw them falling asleep at wheels, farmers driving tractors into hedges, people just sleeping everywhere. London went to sleep. The Avengers were alert. But the baddies, can't remember who, were chasing. And Purdy had got separated from the others. And I seem to remember I was in some sort of pyjama -y thing. You were in your, no, you'd woken up. Uh, Steed had phoned you. You'd woken up and you'd walked out of the front door. Hello, Steed. Yes, I'm on my way. Go and on. then you said, I'm just, he said, is everybody asleep? And you went, let me just check. And then you walked out of your front door and then the front door slammed behind you. It was Slam. a bit of a plot, not a great plot twist, but you were then locked out of your house. And of course, no mobile phones. And then you go and you find a man who's fallen asleep in his car while driving. Push him aside. Roll the VT.
Um, and so it was syndicated, it went everywhere. It was on CBS, it was on CTV in Canada, it was on ITV, it was on RTE mm. in Ireland, TFI, France and Spain. It was all mm. over the world, but mm. you, not for your benefit, just for your global fame. Yeah, but you know, you all know this, because we're in the business, there's nothing like being known for something. It's all, it almost doesn't matter if people like you or not, if they know you. As an actress, the difficulty is of saying, well, I was in a thing, somebody just goes, yeah, well, I didn't see that. No, I didn't see that, didn't see that. And you keep going, well, I was thinking, I was in Hedda Garber, I did this, I, did, I was at the R. well, I didn't see that, didn't see that. If they can see you, if they can see you in something. Now, in The Avengers, after I'd done Dracula films, I'd done Coronation Street, I'd done all kinds of things, nothing had stuck. And suddenly, Purdy in The Avengers stuck. And so I wouldn't have cared now whether I'd done it for nothing for what it gave me, which was an identity, an identity. Incidentally, I must just tell you, when I got the part, she was to be called Charlie. And those of you who might remember in those days, there was um, a scent called Charlie. Charlie, girl walking along, swinging her bag like this, American girl, long floppy hair. And I said, I can't be called Charlie. Also, Charlie's Angels was coming up. They said, what name would you like? And I said, Purdy, the name of the finest shotgun. Bap. And I said, also my hair, which was when I got the part, was down to about here and brown. I said, her hair will be different. It will be cut short. And they said, no, you cannot do that because no heroine has ever had short hair. True. And I said, I will cut it. And they said, you will not. I said, if I cut it, you'll like it. And they said, if you cut it and we don't like it, you've got to pay for a wig yourself. <laughs> so I cut it and they liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll we just stay on drama for a minute before we move on. What, oh, what are you watching at the moment? What do you like? What, what do you and... Oh, it's home. so varied. I mean, I have to say, in the old days, I keep on saying this, but when there were only three channels, you'd go, should we watch that, that or that? Mm -hmm. Now you can watch, as we know, anything. And also you can watch in entire, you can watch entire, the oeuvre of an entire person in one night. You can sit and watch five episodes, eight episodes of something. So it's very difficult. And I quite often like things like, come dine with me <laughs> because I can't believe it. You know what I mean? It's a kind of, it's paradise on a stick. You go, oh, I adore this, I adore this. Look how hateful they're being. Look how smug that person is. They've made something disgusting. They're going, I think I'll win. And you go, no, you won't win. <laughs> I also like Gogglebox because I've made friends. I think I've made friends like all of us with all the people watching. I don't want them to be changed or added to. I just want those people. I know them. I like them sitting in their places. I like to predict what their reactions will be. I love those. Um, and I like Travel programs. <laughs> we're going to come on to those in a minute. Uh, oh, all right. Yeah. Um, and if you were commissioning drama, mm. if you were the head of ITV or BBC One or Channel Four, what would you what would you commission? What do you in the world in the, thinking of drama? Obviously, we've you've gone quite lowbrow quite quickly on Gogglebox. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, well, look, I tell you what it is. I think this is the case. We wouldn't have Tom Stoppard or David Hare. We wouldn't have Alan Akeborn or anybody. If those writers always had to write a series, these people write plays. And I would love to see brought back again a kind of, it, there used to be the Wednesday play, play of the month, play of the week. There used to be a play. Um, it used to be a drama. I think it should be two hours long, um, which is usually you can even take a West End play and trim it and cut it and take out the interval. And that would usually fit in. Robert Powell, and I had put together a company 25 years ago and we thought this is what we will do. We will actually take 10 of the best West End plays which nobody's ever seen outside the West End who hadn't got the money, make them into things. They, oh, because they're in the nature of a play, they will never go outside, so cheapo, cheapo. We'll get local, um, we'll get the best directors in the world. And I said to all, we went to the best directors in the world and said, will you all sign up? And they all said, yes. We went to all the actors, starting with those, those days, it was Judy Dench, people like Kevin Spacey who were in charge. We said, if you do a show for us and it's only five grand, will you do it? They all went, yep. So we got the best actors, the best directors. We said, we will get all the costumes made by drama schools, you know, um, costume schools, St. Martin's School of Art. We will all, we'll do it all in the studios because we can get back production. None of it will go outside. I took it to the BBC and said, ain't this tasty? And they said, no, we, it's not what we want. I understand that now because it isn't what they wanted. But I wanted. 
I now want it. I want to see dramas. I want to see dramas. And I don't want it always to be the first of a series, because that is a very different skill in writing. I'd like to see kind of films. I'd like to see that. Would you like to see that? Am I mad? Would you like to sit and watch one thing and not have to know that you've got to set the machine to record all the next seven or eight? I'd just like to see one thing, one off. Except for unless you're a young actress who thinks, oh God, it's just one off. <laughs> but anyway, the, and if you're, when you're working as an actor, mm. what is a, what, what's a, What's a good thing for a producer and director to do? Because you must have worked with, obviously on the new Avengers, they were quite, they let you have quite a lot of editorial input. You changed the name, you chose the hairstyle. Well, no, that was it. That was all I changed. That was all I changed. That was before I began. Um, you don't usually get much. Sometimes you do, and they say, some writers are very good and say, look, if it doesn't feel easy, just say what feels good in your mouth. Particularly if you're doing modern day um, dramas where people are just speaking to sound like people. Some people don't want a word changed. Some producers have got particularly set ideas about things and quite often as an actor, vainly probably, you proudly think you kind of have got under the skin of your character and you'd like to do something. There's got to be a little bit of give and take. I think the director must have the whip hand um, because otherwise it becomes a bit anarchical and then everybody has a go at it all. It doesn't really work. I found the oddest thing was producing. I produced with the great Verity Lambert. We did six episodes of what was to be an 18 episode called The Caslet Chronicles. Um, the Caslets, it was shortened to. And it was quite sensational. But as the producer, I realized that the actors didn't want me hanging around their trailers and just being what I usually was as an actor, just going, hi, doing anything, just popping in. Because they froze, because I was the other side. So I've always thought maybe producers are always in that position they're the headmaster, and you're in the fourth form when you're an actor. I don't know how we get over that, whether we should get over it. I think you've got to be able to go to the producers and say, these things are going wrong, or can you give a bit more time on this? I think producers have got to be the headmasters, and the directors have somehow got to be somebody in the upper sixth who you trust. <laughs> this is pathetic. Can you see how Enid Blyton runs my life? <laughs> so after drama, or drama comedy as we saw in the New Avengers, mm. the, you were popping along and you, that's when we met when we were doing, when you did the full wax. And is it true, I'm never quite sure if it's true, do you think it was it that first sketch that helped get the role as Patsy or was it, or were they, the two things were happening at the same time? I think, well, Ruby had come to see me in a play called Vanilla, which was on in Shaftesbury Avenue. And um, the play wasn't a huge success. It was a comedy, but it was sort of, it was directed by Harold Pinter, and he didn't, he didn't like the play or the writer, so it's a little bit sad. So that was put a bit of a strain on us. Fabulous cast. I thought it was funny. It didn't work. We only ran for about three weeks. Ruby came to see it, and she came backstage. I'd never met her. I knew who she was. And she said, I want you to work with me. You can work with me. Then you should work with French and Saunders, but you've got to work with me first. So she put my name out. Um, Jennifer always says that it was Adrian Edmondson, her husband, who said you should try Joanna Lumley for Patsy. I don't know how it got there, but maybe I'd sort of got into their, onto the radar a bit of them. And, and, and how was that first? Because Jennifer, for those of us who know her, is quite a terrifying person, really, in, in when you first meet her, because she's, if she doesn't like something, she'll say, I don't really like that. Uh, and if she really likes something, she'll go, yeah, that's really good. <laughs> and so, if you're a producer or an actor or, or an assistant producer or something, you, you, we're all sort of hanging around, just sort of trying to work out what the muttering is. And so, how was that initial meeting with her? What was? Well, she hadn't really put any guidelines down as to what she wanted Patsy to be apart from Eddie's friend. And so, the pilot episode just had us sitting in the back of the taxi. We tried it out in seats, sitting side by side with John Plowman, the producer, just the three of us in a room. And I read the part of Patsy and. And, uh, and there was not a smile on Jennifer's lips. It seemed quite funny. It seemed the, the, the writing was from paradise. When the script arrived in my lap, I couldn't believe it. It was so funny. So unbelievably funny and wicked against the times. Because in those days, at the end of a family show, usually everybody would go, mm, all right, mum. You know, it was a bit sort of sweet. Here, these people were ghastly. And that made me laugh a lot. Made me laugh a lot. 
But I couldn't see who Patsy really was. So we sort of tr tr tried stuff and Jennifer wasn't amused and I went home. And I know I've told this story before, but it's true. I rang up my agent at the time and said, she d she's very shy and she doesn't communicate a lot. So I don't know, but I know that she doesn't really like me. She'll obviously not know how to sack me. So can I just say, I'm so sorry, I don't think I'm right for the part and pull out of it now because it's gonna be agony. My agent at the time said, it's three grand, it's a pilot, do it. <laughs> this is how things begin, darling. <laughs> and so you've done, and so obviously we, we'll, we'll talk about Patsy again in a minute, but you've done masses of, you've done different types of comedy. You've done comedy which is written by a writer, performer, director like Jennifer, where she mm. writes it, performs it, owns it, and is in it. Mm. And then you've done comedies which are written by a team of writers. Mm. What is, do, you, do you think there's one way that makes for a better comedy, or is it... What, what's the... I tell you what makes for good is the writer being there. Um, I was, I was um, Harold's... What was his name? God, what was Harold... What was the Steptoe son's... What's the son called? What oh. was the son of Steptoe and son called? Harold. No, Harold was the old man, wasn't yeah. he? Albert. Albert. I love you, and I'm ashamed of myself. I was Albert's girlfriend on one of those things. And Ray Galton and Alan Simpson turned up at every single rehearsal, standing there with their pads, scribbling, watching a note, seeing what lines were easy to say, weren't so easy to say, were hard. Wilfred Bramble was brilliant. He used to turn up lilac handkerchief, lilac socks and a pearl grey suit, immaculate, beautifully coiffed, immaculately shaved, smart teeth in. And for the old man, he had to take out his teeth and put in horrid teeth and be scruffly hair and put on his old clothes with holes in his elbows. And he hated that. He hated that. Sometimes he took a glass to cheer himself up because he hated doing that old man, funnily enough. Anyway, the truth is they were there. Jennifer was always there. Jennifer could see here, write something extra in. Ruby, Ruby's always there, find something funnier. People have got to be there. There's no use sending in the script like that. I did, um, a, t I did a play with Alan Akebourne, written by Alan Akebourne, directed by Alan Akebourne. And that's when you didn't put a breath in the wrong place because he knew how it would sound. He was the only person I've really worked with, apart from Harold, who won't have you change a breath. He's thought it out, he's got it right, he does it, so that's it. But mostly there's a flexibility and you can find it. And somebody, sometimes you can find a bit of something that works a bit better, works a bit better. In America, they'll try out a show three times. You'll do it on day one, they do the rewrites, you do it on the next day in the afternoon, they do more rewrites, then you do it to a live audience in the evening, then they get the scissors in. Fascinating. You, because Patsy famously is one of the few characters that's walked from one sitcom into another, because Patsy was in Roseanne, wasn't she, for one episode? Wasn't she? Yes, yeah, she was. Patsy and Adina were in Roseanne, the devil's wife or something, I don't know. That's Roseanne was... or the name of the episode? <laughs> no, it was, a, it was a Halloween kind of episode and Roseanne had fallen in love with Jennifer Saunders and she thought it was so funny. Get those girls over here, be on the show. And so we went over to do the show. It was literally awesome. I could write a four volume book on that one week with Roseanne Barr. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they, they do things differently in America and I couldn't admire American comedy more. I think they are sensational. Modern Family, I think, is as good. It's just awesome. Apart from all the other funny, slick things they do. Things like that are bad. So, just before... <coughs> so, Patsy, because when um, Absolutely Fabulous started, it was really meant to be a mother and daughter sitcom. And then, mm. as the years went by, it morphed into a, a sitcom about friendship. Mm. And how did that emerge? Was it just... How did... Were you involved in the evolution of Patsy? No. Not really, I was just Patsy, but I think Jennifer liked the Patsy who began appearing and she couldn't resist writing stuff for her because she realised that <clears throat> with Patsy, who after all hasn't eaten since 1974 and has had all her organs removed, so there's almost nothing that can kill her or affect her. She, she's like a cartoon character. And so there's no reason why Patsy shouldn't have taken a few hormones and let, gone down to Morocco and had something stitched on and how after a year with a slight moustache it fell off and then she just came back and became a woman again. I mean, you can do that if you're Patsy and she just could morph in and out of things. She stuck, she said she was always 39. We've seen them old, but they never seemed... I wanted Patsy again to, to have that kind of almost cartoonish quality of always having her hair, red mouth, hair up. 
because um, Brian Ricks once said to me, I was in a comedy with Brian Ricks, playing a small part on stage, the Garrick Theatre, my first play in the West End. And I asked for a dress. I said, Brian, this is three months later. Three months later, do you think that Miss Parkin should have a new dress? He said, no, don't change your clothes. The audience won't know who you are. And I thought, ooh, crikey. So that's a bit of a lesson. Try to stay the same. And in comedy, try to present kind of roughly the same person. So that's one of Patsy's successes, her hairdo. Hugely uh, popular with the LGBT community, obviously. Yeah. Patsy Nadina. And you got the freedom. I think it was the... the gay community in New York were the first people oh, yeah. to properly embrace them, embrace those characters, weren't they? And give, didn't you get the freedom of New York? We for... did. We got the freedom. I'm an, I have the freedom of New York till I fall down dead. And it was really from the LGBT mayor of the time. Uh, it, it was very touching. It was extraordinary. I think it's because we'd managed to... Jennifer, weed. Jennifer had written in. She was c colour blind against casting. She didn't give a damn how people were. Um, she didn't give a damn any shortfalls. One of our actors had got a leg missing, didn't Chris, who always played it with a limp because he had lost a leg in a motorbike accident. We had every color under the sun and she also had um, every kind of, every kind of liaison. She was always longing for Safi to be a lesbian. She was always longing for, she was so thrilled that her son Serge was gay, so thrilled. And when she found him, he was wearing a little cardigan like Safi and was a little dull boy. She was furious and preferred his very gay and flamboyant friend. So we crossed all kind of boundaries, made everything perfectly acceptable. And this transgender thing, which rather jumped the gun, I think. Shall we have a little look at uh, Patsy in action? The joy, I have to say, the joy of this show was that it was June, the five J's, which was Jennifer and Joanna, June, Julia, and Jane Horrocks. We used to just, on, honestly in rehearsals, just cry with laughter, but June Whitfield, is she not gold? Now, Dame June Whitfield, thank goodness. June, who is quite small, is now that big. Absolutely in perfect order, all marbles there, completely perfect, except I can pick her up like that now. <laughs> Just divine. And working with Julia Sawala, I tell you, she's, she, A, she's got a photographic memory, so she just looks at a page and she's got the whole lot. B, she never corpses, never, unlike Jennifer, never corpses, unlike Jane Horrocks, who once she starts can't be stopped. Um, just magic girl. And little, little dull little Safi, who I'm afraid to say a lot of men find rather attractive. Um, little Safi like that. When you meet Julia, she's so different. Heels that high hair up all on one side, lipstick across here. She's extraordinary. So to have sustained Safi for 25 years is quite something. Fabulous. Well, we're now going to move on to what we in television sexually call non-scripted programming. Yeah. Um, uh, so if you're not a TV executive, and I know there are some people here who aren't uh, in the television industry, that's basically documentaries of anything or anything that's not made up. So it uh, covers a whole multiple of sins, as we know, from across programming to entertainment uh, to Love Island. Have you watched Love Island? I, f I feel I have. <laughs> I ha no, I haven't. I, not, not because I didn't want to, I haven't. You haven't? You never... never... Because I'm so busy. Yeah, of, course, of course. Now, so... I'm not against it. But you have uh, recently... Well, no, over the years have got into doing... You've done travel programmes for a long time, but mm. you've, you've, you've been doing a lot of them in the last, in the last few years, mm. and I have made a lot of them with you. And everyone... People often say to me, if, you, if ever, it's anyone who says, oh, what do you do, Clive? And I say, oh, I... I make um, travel documentaries, and they say, oh, anything we see. I say, oh, I, I make Joanna Lumley's. Oh, did you make Northern Lights? <laughs> That's the one I didn't make, and it's always the one that's uh, mentioned. But we did make together uh, Girl Friday, mm. which was, uh, we filmed 25 years ago, next February. Uh, in And uh, we took you to a desert island, and uh, you had to survive for 10 days. I was quite young, inexperienced producer. Weirdly, I was looking back now, I was 31, I think, at the time, and it was a BBC One Hour, and I was in Janet Street Porter's department, and they said, do you know Joanna Lumley? Oh, yes, I've worked with her. I've done one sketch. And so, and then nowadays, I don't think anybody in the BBC will probably wouldn't nowadays give me, even now, give me the, that uh, responsibility. But we went off to a desert island, and... Uh, I, then I was quite. I remember going to an early meeting, and I was, the, 
it wasn't my idea. Another executive had come up with the idea. Joanna Lumley spies on Desert Island. And I said, and how will it be? And they said, oh, it'll be so funny. Said, Pat, Abfab had just started and had just taken off. And we'll see Joanna on the Desert Island with a bottle of champagne and heels. And then she'd be like, oh, how will I survive? And stuff like that. So I wrote out sort of a mini script anyway. And then I went to see Joanna. And I said, well, we thought we'd see it with you with us on the Desert Island with a glass of champagne and high heels. She fixed me with that look that junior ministers who've dealt with her over the Gurkhas know and fear. She said, we will not be doing that. <laughs> will we, Clive? And I, and, I, and I said, no, no. She wanted to, quite rightly, do it normally, play it straight, go onto a desert island. And uh, it was pre, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, uh, Survivor, The mm. Island, all mm. those programmes that have followed, of which makes me feel a bit stupid, obviously, because I probably could have formatted it and, 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 uh, and made lots and lots of money. But what was that experience like for you? Obviously, I know what it was like as the... As the... Well, I was the first of four of those programmes you made. Yeah. And the other were Lenny, Lenny Henry, yeah. Billy Connolly yeah. and Ross Kemp, weren't yeah. they? So those are pr pretty roughy tufty boys, and me is the first one. None of the other three could survive with what life had given me to survive on. A ha one pound of rice. Oh, look. This shows how important this was. I keep practically nothing from any of my life. I've been working 50 years in the business. I keep the odd script and odd bits and pieces. From Girl Friday, it was such a colossal part of my life that I knew it would have changed me forever, which it did. So I kept things like um, one pound of rice. This is what I survived on, just that for the whole week. There was no fruit on the island. Ten There's days. no food on t 10 days. Yeah. That's all. And to eat that, I had a rusty tin, which I haven't brought with me, but I had a shell to eat it with because I didn't have a spoon or a fork. And I had a shell to eat it out of. That's my spoon shell. Um, I had a ladle to take stuff out, which I made from a coconut shell which I screwed together and tied with this. I'd had what they called training before I'd gone on. I went down to the Irish Guards at Purbright. And training on television, as you know, is being seen to be training. You don't actually do it. You sit down there and I go, hmm, and watch with a whole lot of soldiers, watching them sieving water through charcoal and socks. And you go, hmm, and then they go, come on. And you go, I haven't learned this. And you go, just come on. How to make a fire and a thing. And you go, I haven't learned this. Said, come on. So I had no training at all, but I had an SAS handbook and a little tin of what the SAS had given me. Three um, light matches which would light in a monsoon, but don't use them. Two anodin, in case I felt ill. A curved needle in case I cut my arm open so I could suture myself up again. A big knife um, and a small knife. I had to give the small knife back again. But I think, I, oh no, I've got my small knife here. I kept these things because I thought nobody will ever believe me. My granddaughters won't believe me. That's my knife. And most important, Clive, I know you want to ask me this. Now, wait for the, this is the... This, oh, Clive, this, let me tell them, let me tell, tell them. them. Because this next moment, I yeah. think... Possibly, uh, my whole career has been built on this next moment, uh, and uh, so let's uh, let's see the VT from this. We had to record. I had to record. I'm completely non-techy, but they give me a camera, and every night I had to prop it up, hope I was in vision, and do my recordings, um, and then switch it off again. It was incredibly tough. It was thrilling, but it was incredibly tough. And my biggest fear was the trench foot because my feet were so soft and the inside of the cave was like, um, because it was volcanic rock, it was like razor blades. And so this was necessity being the mother of invention. Now, in those days, I had a bra. Can I, can I do my story go on, now? Go on this was my bra from Marks and Spencer's um, and it fastened at the front. So that was it. And I knew that if I undid it like that, I could see, you can see already, how that folded over could make a little thing. And if I cut it there, I would be able to wrap that over my shoe. These are the only things I've asked to be buried with me when I die. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> these, these are the very little shoes I made. 
And the extraordinary thing was, is because this happens when you are up against it. I only had a certain amount of twine, which they thought I would do fishing with. And I didn't do that thing of plunging onto one shoe. I thought each shoe must have exactly the same amount. So I measured the twine and cut it exactly in half. I had my needle for sewing up my arm. And then all I needed was just to think, just to think about it. Honestly, just adore. Do, just, you can just have a moment of adoring. Okay, that's the end of that. <laughs> I'm gonna put them away, but these things I keep with me. That was my mic. It's because I haven't been trained long in television. Um, <laughs> These things I keep because it's very easy to forget, and either to exaggerate or underestimate what you did. It was the toughest thing I've ever done, and the happiest, because I realized after that, because after such a short time, I could tell, I could smell when the, when the rain was coming. Three minutes to come to the rain, I could smell. I could hear when the tide was turning. I knew, after only four, five, six days alone on the island, I knew when the, so my animal instincts were just Maybe very close these, to the surface. Well, just put them with, away. With <laughs> um, it was just very comforting, and I thought, if I fall down dead, there's no real problem. You just get washed away into the sea. So uh, this is my short lesson today. Don't be afraid of dying. OK, that's the end of that. Okay. Doesn't seem to close, that one. No, it doesn't close. Good. <laughs> Well, oh, I loved it. No, anyway, Clive, I loved it. I loved that trip. I loved it. I loved it. I loved having to live off nothing but lime squeezed onto that. There was one lime tree. I loved the feeling of um, being alone, where you have no clothes, you've got no choices, you've got nothing to lock up. You own nothing. There's nobody there to steal it. So something, the burdens that we carry about today, all of us today on our shoulders, have we locked the car? Have we got our phones? Is the phone switched off? Have we got this? Where do we park? What are we going to eat? Have I got enough money? All those things. There's, there's none. You have nothing. You are nobody. You're on an island where there never has been a language. You named them places. I called it the Albert Hall because my husband was conducting Kiritakano at the Albert Hall while I was away in, in, in this northwest island off the northwest coast of Madagascar. I call things the old grumpy old man. I call things the ship beach and things like this. I could name them. They were my places. And you have to name things because here in Scotland in particular, you come over and you go, have they really called that little bump of hill a name? And the answer is yes, because if your sheep are lost or if there's a tree down or if there's a flood in the valley, you've got to know exactly where it is. For survival, you've got to have names. That's why human beings are mad about names. When we can't think up new names, we take the old names with us. Hence, New York. Do you want me to shut this now or not? Yeah, I don't know how to do it. I think well, I do, you just do that. The, um, <laughs> and that's why you survived. We, um, uh, it was obviously a phenomenal success, Girl Friday. It went out, it got like 15 million viewers the night it went out, Whoa. which is amazing. But it was also partly because Alan Yentob had moved it at the last minute. It was meant to go out on a Wednesday night and it moved to Saturday night. And it, was, it went out the night, it went out after the second ever lottery. And I don't know if those of us who remember when the lottery started, the whole nation stopped because we all thought we were going to win. So we inherited like probably 30 million viewers. But anyway, it, was, it did phenomenally well and people remember it to this day. You've now gone on to do lots of travel mm. shows. And I believe there's a very good series about to come out on My ITV. Oh, Clive, there is. And how <laughs> lovely that you produced it. September the 12th. And I've made by Burning Bright Productions, which I've heard are very good. Um, Shall we have a little look yes. at uh, the what new series? What, what, this, what? Is, what we we, uh, this is the Silk Road where we've filmed, Joanna has filmed four episodes. four episodes from Venice to China. We spent most of the summer making it. In fact, we spent most of the summer sitting next to each other in a car. And I was joking backstage that most of the time when sitting next to each other over the last four weeks, we've literally fallen asleep as we, and then stood up. Oh, isn't Kyrgyzstan lovely? And then we <laughs> but, um, this is a little clip, mainly of some, some of the scenes in episodes two and four, because for complicated reasons, we're editing it out of order. But, uh, so this was something that we uh, made just to show people some sort of essence of the new series. So if we could roll that VT, that'd be great. Hello, ladies. <gasps> oh, look, gosh, she's got, look how, look how shiny. Yagrezba, chorta normo, panjota ginon, dusata non vrot. The smell here when they're setting up for the new baking. <gasps> I know. <laughs> I can't tell you how good it is. It's very dense. Please come through. It's very dense. Thick, dense, so it's not light and furry in here. 
Presente ist der alte Baum und Zukunft. Die Zukunft ist die Zukunft. Die Zukunft ist die Zukunft. Die Zukunft What sort of personality does this bird have? Is she a good girl? Character is an old Japanese and the Turku Alanda, Jinim and Garmato Sundelexner. Although beautiful Bishkek, capital of Kyrgyzstan, is now a city of over a million and a quarter people. In the old days, when it was part of the Sogdian Empire, it was just a simple trading post on the important Silk Road, travelling from China all the way across to the east. And, and, and whilst it was very, very green, a very, very green city, holy smoke. And, I'm guessing this is where all the action takes place. <gasps> Look, silk, silkworms, cocoons. <sighs> Look at that lovely little creature. These little darlings have made people richer than a king's ransom. Just by producing what's natural to them and to us is desired. Silk. I'm wearing one as a brooch because I've become very attached to him. Follow me on my Silk Road adventure. Why do you love doing those travel documentaries? Because they're quite hard work. I mean, I mean obviously accompanying you, I know that, you know, 14 hour days, you don't have anyone doing your hair and makeup. There's only five of us. You nearly, quite often, you get up an hour or so before us. You come down in the morning. We're all sitting there having breakfast. After about four or five minutes, you sort of stamp your foot and say, what do you think about today's outfit? And usually it's me and the cameraman and something. We all look at it and go, oh yeah, it's great, it's great. But so rude, I tell you, working with men all the time, they just don't care. And you go, I wore this yesterday, but I had something slightly different. Do you think that around the neck works better? Or do you think they go, yeah, well, whatever. And it's not what you wanted. Um, and I have to remember whether, you know, sometimes you have to shoot things out of order. Would I have had that on or off? Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Nobody really notices, as Clive has pointed out, nobody's looking at me. <laughs> and um, uh, the days are long, but there's something quite extraordinary about the, the open road. Those, there are those of us who are homebodies and those of us who are travellers. Most of us have got a bit of each. And I love being at home, making home a nice place. But I love the white road winding. And there's something about particularly this particular story of the Silk Roads. Silk Roads, because as uh, both Peter Frankopan and Colin Thubron have pointed out, there was no road. There was just a series of interconnected routes through which trade flowed over land and, of course, down by water as well. But we were concentrating on, the, on this central bit coming silk, because it was started in China, going all the way across to Europe, where people were waiting like this for this fabulous quality stuff. But, of course, coming from Europe was going stuff that China wanted. And particularly from the middle of uh, Kyrgyzstan, a valley, the Fergana Valley, the horses there were called the horses of heaven to the Chinese. So they would trade bolts of silk for the horses and so on. Absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal story. And Central Asia was a part of the world I longed to visit. I longed to visit. So when we were given permission to do the Silk Road adventure, we call it that because so we've had to... This is history. This is centuries of stuff. Centuries of stories through eight different countries. And uh, so we could, you always hate me saying this, it's like a pe pebble skimming, it isn't quite like that. But we drop in on certain things that might be interesting, might be interesting, might be interesting. What is interesting is seeing the silkworms. To hold those little creatures and to hear them eating. They said, when the, silk, when the silkworms eat, it sounds like the sea. So we brought the, the sound man and just said, listen. And he put up his microphone and there was the sound of, no, rain, rain the rain yeah. falling. <laughs> Millions of little mouths eating, eating, eating mulberries. Well, 
we've actually run out of time. Oh no, that, stop! What, I know, don't make you me go. Would, you wouldn't. He stop. always does this. He goes, "You've had enough." You've just winded up. Um, we the app has started to work. Very. There's a few questions. Uh, somebody, Kevin from ITV, will you do ten part series next year? No, thanks, that's not Kevin. Good. Charlotte, uh, Ben from Channel Five, I love you more than all of them. Yeah, well, that's just silly. These are questions. Um, well, let me take one question. Um, you've been shooting since the 1960s mm. uh, in, on television. What's the biggest industry change that uh, since you've started out? Oh, for sure, working on video. I mean, in the old days, you had to take cans and cans of film. And if you were lucky, if you were filming abroad, and you'd be the rushes to take back to England. And so you'd arrive at Heathrow and somebody would come and collect the rushes and take them back for them to be... Nobody knew what they had on camera. So now, directors can sit at the corner and they're seeing this, they're looking quite often. In the old days, they'd stand behind the cameraman and see if what they wanted is shown. Now, they just sit in a corner and watch it. So they know what they're getting. So I swear this is the biggest difference. It's the same with our, our little cameras. I mean, the difference between, hello, Whitehall 1392, and what we have now mm. is just immeasurably different. So I would say in technology is the biggest difference. And also how mean they've got. When I was in the Bond film, I only had two lines. We were on it for two months. Now, I sometimes play a name above the title, and I'm on it for three days. So it's just different, that's all. Well, um, I shouldn't have said mean, should I? You shouldn't have said no, mean. Okay, you shouldn't sorry. have ended like that. That was, no. annoying. That was very long. Um, we'd um, no. uh, I'd like, uh, like to thank uh, Edinburgh TV Festival for inviting us. I'd like to thank Phil and Lisa for uh, making it all happen. Yeah. And, uh, Please all go and listen to Michaela Cole this evening. I think she's going to be amazing. She's going to be here. Yeah, and so that's going to be fabulous. And uh, I thought the best way to end it, I wondered what uh, Jennifer and Joanna or Patsy and Adina would be like when they were old. And then I, when I was looking through AbFab clips, I found this last clip. So uh, let's uh, quickly look at what uh, Jennifer and Joanna, Patsy and Adina will be like in 30 years' time. Not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> so not a bad life. Not a bad life, darling. Yeah, not a bad life. Thank you.